The Curse of the Scythian Burial Mounds What a charming brooch the Empress has! A gift from Prince Gagarin, recovered from the burial mounds. Oh, they say no good comes from this gold. The prince also sent it to the heir to the throne. The son of the Tsar is dead, and Gagarin himself is now in prison. So he, as you have heard, yearns for another type of gold, referred to as dust, from rumor and hearsay. The cursed gold was undoubtedly discussed a great deal in the corridors of power, but only out of earshot of Tsar Peter. He was short-tempered and did not care for gossip. It was not the first expedition to return empty-handed, but so many lives were ruined that discussion cannot be avoided. Our tale is set in the territory of modern Kazakhstan, Altai and Siberia, a story worthy of Indiana Jones, the ruinous gold of the nomads. The opening exhibits of the Kunstkamera Museum they stood here for some time while the manuscripts were being collected. The statuettes were here too, chasing the elusive gold. The story of Prince Gagarin is generally a murky one, and dark archaeology during the reign of Peter the Great. Hundreds of graves were dug up in search for items of gold. Who sought the treasures of the Saka? How the pursuit of gold began and how it came to an end hidden artifacts from ancient tombs, the curse of the Scythian burial mounds. Chapter 1. Ruinous Gold I commission you to make a journey to Siberia and discover the evil deeds of Governor Gagarin, investigate the gold at all costs and find out if it's real and from whom he learned of it. You need to locate those individuals and learn of Lieutenant Colonel Buchholz and how the Yamashevsky fortress was taken from him, Peter I. As always, Peter the Great made demands that were multifaceted and ambitious. St. Petersburg, Zayachi Island. It began to be used as a prison a few years after the founding of the Peter and Paul fortress. The first political prisoner was Alexei Petrovich, the son of Peter the Great. The prince was sentenced to death. The signature of Likarev, the assessor of the investigative commission, was 51st on the list. At this time, Peter the Great had those he referred to as my majors, reliable individuals who carried out his personal assignments. In January 1719, Ivan Likarev, incidentally a descendant of a noble Tatar family, was released from all other duties. The Major of the Guard had been appointed to investigate a new case. The story of Major Gagarin is generally a murky one. This murky story led to the death of more than a thousand people, and even that of the Prince himself. He was a shadowy figure, a brilliant organizer, diplomat, treasure hunter and bribe taker a descendant of the Rurik dynasty and 18th century billionaire, the owner of the Scythian Saka treasures, who held huge bank accounts in London, the oligarch of the era of Peter the Great, Matvey Gagarin. He was the emperor's viceroy in Siberia, the Siberian governor. Governor of the Siberian kingdom, that was his chosen title. For a long time, the emperor was pleased with Gagarin's work, especially with his diplomatic abilities. He skillfully built relationships with the Chinese, Jungar, Mongols, and the Kazakh sultans. Unable to face the Jungars alone, and on the advice of Tauke Khan, Kaip and Abul Khair opened peace negotiations with the Siberian governor, Prince Matvey Gagarin. The latter, of course, was appreciative of this and reciprocated. Georgi Katanayev, Prince Gagarin. It seems that the Siberian governor was as ambitious as Peter in terms of large-scale projects. 
he persuaded the Tsar to build fortresses on the Irtysh and even offered to fund them. He also provided an excellent incentive, sensational intelligence. Allegedly, somewhere in the Jungarian city of Yarkand, there was so much gold that it could be scooped up in carpets, and it could all be found along the banks of the Irtysh. Prince Gagarin bought gold dust from merchants who allegedly came from Xinjiang. He then sent it to St. Petersburg, saying that there was such a river, the Irket, Lake Irket, where gold dust was found in abundance that could be scooped up with shovels. Peter the Great had been informed of alluvial gold. When the rivers overflow in spring, anyone can collect sand with a blanket like this, which, once rinsed, will reveal this kind of gold. Peter was always short of money. He had global plans, besides which, he was at war with the Swedes. At that time, there were already two routes into Central Asia. The one through Siberia involved Prince Gagarin and the alluvial gold. The second was via the eastern coast of the Caspian Sea. Two expeditions were dispatched, one being from Siberia and the other from the Caspian. However, they had a common goal, to reach the gold-bearing city of Yarkand. It's my understanding that their geographical knowledge did not match up to the real-world locations. They thought it was close. Lieutenant Colonel Buchholz, who traveled via Siberia, was ordered to found a city near Lake Yamish, travel up the Irtysh as far as the boat will allow, reach Yarkand and capture it. Peter the Great. In October 1715, the detachment arrived at its destination and construction began. The laying of the fortress foundations was supervised by an engineer who had been captured from the Swedes. Lake Yamish, which is not far from Pavlodar, is a Kazakh word for healer. It is known today as Tuskala. Jungars, Kazakhs and Russians were all busy extracting salt. Goods were exchanged here. Certain skirmishes, even hostilities, regularly took place over the capture and control of the lake. Buchholz became involved in such hostilities. Salt was a strategically important product, and imposing a military monopoly upon it would not prove popular. The lieutenant colonel sent an envoy to the Jungar Khan, saying that the expedition was peaceful. But the letter was intercepted by Kazakh detachments. They were the sworn enemy of the Jungars, and thus the fortress was attacked. Buchholz came under fire from the Jungars, he returned empty-handed and was arrested for the failure of the expedition. The siege lasted three months. Buchholz surrendered. The fortress was destroyed and what was left of the detachment went up the Irtysh where they founded the fort of Omsk. But the mission had not been completed and only a quarter of the company remained. Major Likarev was sent to investigate the failures of Buchholz and Gagarin. He was assigned this mission in order to bring the embezzler's nefarious activities to light. The Siberian governor was forced to come to St. Petersburg, ostensibly to participate in the investigation of the case involving the son of the Tsar. Meanwhile, Likarev departed in the opposite direction, with the impatient Tsar waiting the result of the investigation. Prince Gagarin was proven to have been involved in around 100 different cases of extortion. Buchholz's name was cleared, and our attention now moves onto the matter of the gold dust. What were the fortresses really built for? Where did Likarev go? And did he locate the gold? Chapter 2 – The Secrets of the Fortress To seek the route to Yarkand, act without excessive enthusiasm so as not to take losses or inflict harm. Peter the Great In the spring of 1720, Likarev was at the helm of an expedition of gold prospectors on their way to Lake Zaisan. He embarked on a journey from Tobolsk on three light ships. According to the report given to Peter the Great, 
The riverbanks were overgrown with reeds, and there were no forests to be found on the shores of Lake Saisan. He therefore considered it impossible to build a fortress there. The major ordered the lake and the river Irtish to be thoroughly investigated. The banks were described and its depth and width were measured. But the kind of gold that can be collected with a horse's blanket was not found in this area, nor en route to Yarkand. Major Likarev reached the Zaisan Valley only to be attacked by the Zhungars and forced to leave. The city was founded a century and a half later. Likarev, after several skirmishes, managed to reach an agreement with the Zhungars. At first, the Zhungars were convinced that the Russians were colluding with the Chinese, their main enemies at the time, and that they were planning a combined attack. The Russians replied that the only goal of the expedition was to discover the origin of the upper and lower Irtish, and whether it was possible to reach the sources and locate the ore. The Zhungars even accompanied the expedition with well-wishes and gifts, apparently to ensure that nothing was afoot. This was a very beautiful and picturesque place where the Irtish merges with the Olba. This is where the fortress of Uskamenogorsk was built. Is it somewhere around here? Yes, literally here. The bank has widened just a little, but in fact the mouth of the Irtish was larger than the Olba, and this place was a densely forested area. The first fortifications were built from these trees. A moat and palisade were erected around the fort, and earthen ramparts were subsequently built. This was a convenient place for the construction of a fortress. It was Likarev who built the second fortress, which was called Ust Kamenea. The first, called Semipalatnea, was established by Lieutenant Colonel Prokofi Stupin in 1718. According to the plan of the enterprising Prince Gagarin, and, possibly with secret intent, about 20 fortresses were founded during the pursuit of the gold. They were known as the so-called Irtish Line. Part of the Kazakh clans and tribes that were attacked by the Zhungars began to move to the right bank of the Irtish and settle there to enjoy the protection of the Cossack military installations. The building of a number of fortresses, including Ustkamenogorsk and the later Cossack village of Malo Narimskaya, had a somewhat sobering effect on the Zhungars. The city of Zaizan completed the chain of fortresses that were built against the Zhungars. However, the reaction of Peter the Great to all this grandiose construction was absolutely unexpected, but more on that later. How did the curse of Scythian gold manifest itself? What treasures were stowed away by Prince Gagarin? Why did Likarev go to Ablakit? Chapter 3 The Tomb Raider In addition to embezzlement, the prince was engaged in archaeology, and it appears that this was the main source of his untold wealth. At that time, many so-called tomb raiders would search for gold in burial mounds, but the governor acted on an industrial scale. Hundreds of graves were dug up specifically to search for items made of gold. Entire crews would be sent out in search of treasures, while the governor would look for ancient manuscripts, study local legends and send smaller scale expeditions for archaeological exploration. All information was kept in strict confidence. Examination of only a single record reveals the scale on which these burial mounds were plundered. In December 1716, the governor sent the Tsar 96 large gold items and 20 small items weighing more than 22 kilograms from the Scythian burial mounds. Georgi Katanayev, Prince Gagarin. In order for the emperor to indulge him in his weaknesses, the governor regularly presented the empress with Scythian jewelry 
and sent the first batch to the newborn son of Peter in 1715. The young prince died at the age of four. It was following this that people allegedly began to speak of the curse of burial mound gold. Because quite literally over a short period of time, his children began to die one by one. Five of the emperor's children died after 1715. Such a terrible coincidence. But such mysticism would not sway the governor. He kept most of the burial gold for himself. At times, he simply melted the unique artifacts down. Many did the same at that time. And only in 1721, after the saga with the prince, did Peter issue a decree forbidding the ancient wonders to be spoiled. The quote was, and the grave robbers to be put to death if they are caught. In Peter's so-called Siberian collection, there are many gold items from burial mounds in Kazakhstan. Scythian gold in the Hermitage. Many items from this collection were sent to Peter the Great by Gagarin. According to one of the allegations, the mounds near Tobolsk were completely emptied. The prince turned his attention to the territory of modern Kazakhstan. In order to safely explore new areas, it was necessary to build military fortresses and make friends with the local Khans, as well as find a plausible excuse to implement the plan. Gold dust. When under interrogation, Gagarin insisted on the reliability of his information about gold. But the prince's claims were never proven. Here is another attempt by Gagarin to give credibility to the deception. In a letter to Witzen, the burgomaster of Amsterdam and friend of the Tsar, Gagarin told him of the discovery of gold near Lake Yamashev and included a sample. Obviously, Gagarin was aware of Peter's upcoming expedition and hoped that Witzen would show him a sample of that gold. But Witzen gave it to the assay office, where it was determined that the gold was probably Chinese. Ekaterina Knajetskaya New information about Likharev's expedition. According to legend, the governor hid his jewelry, most of which was Scythian gold, when he left for St. Petersburg. He supposedly built an underground storage facility with the help of captured Swedes. Likharev never found the treasure. Obviously, some of these treasures are indeed buried somewhere. But where? Attempts to solve this riddle have been made for three centuries now. One quest for the gold even took place in the prince's mansions and dungeons. In Siberia, Moscow, St. Petersburg. Perhaps those were the wrong places to look? Eastern Kazakhstan. Ruins of a Buddhist monastery. Ablaikit famed for its legends about ancient treasures. Likarev's detachment came here in 1720. He also had another secret mission, to uncover all the unsavory deeds of Prince Gagarin. Perhaps the governor knew about these places and had heard about the legends of untold riches and the golden Buddha that stood in the monastery. Or perhaps his crew had already worked here and hid their findings nearby. Likarev allegedly headed for Ablaikit to look for the prince's hidden treasures. They remained here for some time while collecting the manuscripts and the statuettes. Their camp stood here for about a week or ten days. They may have camped there even longer. But neither the prince's treasures nor the gold-bearing rivers were ever found. This is also strange since, as a result of the expedition, a map of the monastery was made. The Ablakitka River was on that map, which means that it was investigated. However, it appears they were not thorough enough. Some of its tributaries were known amongst the locals as sources of alluvial gold. And there were many legends about treasures. Люди. People living in eastern Kazakhstan would take a bucket and collect gold after heavy rainfall. 
rumors abounded of chunks of gold as large as a horse's head. Of course, no gold dust was found. However, this means that he probably found plenty of something else. The fact is, there is gold here, because all the rivers flowing into the Yatish are gold-bearing ones. They include Bukhtarma, Ulba, Gromatucha. This was a missed opportunity. It turns out that Likarev did not complete the majority of the Tsarist orders. What helped Likarev escape punishment? How did the curse of the Scythians destroy the governor? From whose treasure did the mysterious figurines originate? Epilogue in search of treasure. The death mask of Peter the Great makes a gruesome impression. It is as though Bartolomeo Rastrelli, who created it, tried to soften his features, which seems to have created a kind of devilish grin. St. Petersburg, Kunstkamera. It is said that for some time the samples of the gold dust that Gagarin had presented to the emperor were kept here. After Likharev's report, the Tsar's anger was especially furious, but even under torture, the prince declared that the information concerning the gold was correct, and he never revealed the hiding place of the treasures. The curse of the Scythian barrows finally caught up with the Siberian governor in 1721. In a rage, Peter the Great ordered the prince to be hanged, and his body to be displayed on the gallows for seven months. Forts that were built upon Gagarin's orders were to be destroyed, and an alliance with the Jungarian ruler was to be forged and maintained as the search for gold continued. To strengthen the Yamashevskaya fortress and destroy any new ones. To initiate not-for-profit trade activities with the Jungars, as well as sending skilled people alongside the merchants to uncover information about the gold. Discover if and how it is possible to take possession of that place. Peter I. But the fortress, for some unknown reason, was not destroyed. How did Likarev escape the Emperor's wrath? Once again, the Kunstkamera. The original collections housed by the museum have not survived. They perished in a fire. Among them were the ones that Likarev brought from Ablekit, including nine bronze statuettes and ancient manuscripts. The manuscripts that survived show the origins of the study of Tibetology. This area was developing in Russia, and it was this monument that made such a contribution to its exploration. The emperor was delighted with the gift. He pardoned Likarev, sent some of the manuscripts to the Louvre to be read, and put the figurines in his office to have sketches of them made. The engravings were later published in Paris. The discoveries included Indian goddesses, horsemen, and a statue of a Roman emperor. And here's a peculiar development. According to modern research, some of the figurines could not have been found in Ablaikit. In which case, how did they end up with Likarev? There were rumors that he did indeed find the treasures on a sheet of gold weighing 16 pounds. Perhaps these were the prince's treasures, or something else. Either way, how could the Major have hidden what he had found? He was not only brave, but was a very honest and principled person. The remainder of Likarev's life was not spent in the lap of luxury. So perhaps the treasures of the Siberian governor are still hidden somewhere on the route to Ablaikit. It is said that there is plenty of gold and gemstones from the burial grounds, 800 pounds, no less. They were transported on three carts. No one will find it without a treasure map. The prince knew where they would look for it, so he hid it in the steppe, from rumors and hearsay. <laughs>